Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Oscar Movie Marathon, where I watch a Best Picture winner from the Academy Awards every week, starting with 1970 and hopefully ending in the present day. I make a video every decade to kind of summarize the trends and what I noticed, and also, of course, ranking every Best Picture winner of that decade. So without further ado, let's go back in time to the decade of Reaganomics, where movie theaters were filled with melodramas, sweaty slow-mo shots, and biopic escapism. Talking about the 1980s. So let's get started. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna talk about the best picture winners from the 80s and kind of seeing all the trends I noticed in those instead of pouring research into the 80s movie trends because let's face it, the 70s were more streamlined in what they wanted to achieve. The United Artists, the new auteurs, the new Hollywood wave. The 80s is a little more complex because it's a lot of producers that are in charge and their job is to put butts in seats so instead of the down-on-your-luck anti-heroes always losing from the 70s, you got a lot of steroid dudes that are really sweaty winning the fight against communists in the boxing ring or as fighter pilots. So the Oscars did not really reflect that at all. We'll see. The prevalent themes I noticed in the Oscar winners is more visual, more atmospheric and tonal than real themes or messages because it's a lot of escapism. Exotic locations, cradle to grave biopics of these great people in history, royals but kind of aristocrats that see the end of one era and the start of another. It's kind of a transitional period of history that we keep watching in these beautifully shot exotic locations with wild animals and strange architecture. Even though the story is telling like in a historical event or a historical person, it, the movie itself is more focused on the visuals and the epic scope rather than telling the truth of this person's story. But also I feel like that's most Oscar winning history biopics. That's just kind of the name of the game. And in the 80s, it's no different. Besides the escapist biopics, you have melodramas everywhere. And I didn't really understand what a melodrama was until I watched these 80s movies. Uh, Cause when I think of the 80s, I think of action. Like all the sequels to the 70s movies, Aliens, Terminator 2, Rambo 2, like, you know, dudes blowing stuff up and like helicopters and fun special effects and all that. But for the Oscar winners, it was more melodramas and some people even call them 80s weepies, which started more on uh, ABC after school specials than in theaters, but the brand kind of stuck. And it's kind of like 1985's One Too Many is apparently a prime example of it. I didn't have time to watch it, but I do have it on my list just to kind of compare it to some of these movies. If you watched May, December on Netflix last year, you know what a melodrama is. It's basically these wild characters uh, sometimes in a domestic setting, but mostly in big exotic vistas, you know, visually dramatic. And it's more about the plot, like things just happening to these characters to make it more dramatic, very emphasized emotion, bombastic, sensationalized storytelling. So it's less about like how the character evolves and more this character hates this character, big shouting matches in a living room kind of thing. That, that's pretty much what a melodrama is. Sometimes the living room is in suburbia, sometimes it's in Africa. It's just kind of how it works, but it's a lover's quarrel or family members that just hate each other because of uh, their past haunting them. It's just big, 
crazy things that just happen to people rather than people trying to, I don't know, become a boss or something. It's, it's not like a personal goal towards something. It's people bashing their heads against each other through tears and shouting matches. Those are the two sides of the coin for the 80s Oscar pictures. And besides two of them, of the Best Picture winners, they're all period pieces. Audiences in the 80s were done with the 70s. The 70s was all about now. Everything is wrong, everything is going bad, the system is broken. The 80s is all about, let's get out of here. Let's go back in time to the good old days where the main conflict was, he doesn't love me. Like that, that's the melodrama part. It's, it's escapism. You wanna escape reality, you wanna to go to the theater, and watch these giant, beautifully shot movies where you can kind of turn off your brain and pretend you exist in a different world. That's kind of the purpose of a lot of these movies, that escapist fantasy. And because it's high drama, high emotion, uh, the Oscars liked it too, so they gave it awards. Nom, 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 nom. That's gonna fall out eventually. So let's, let's start with the movies. Let's, let's get right through it. Ordinary People came out in 1980, so it was the first 80s movie to win an Oscar. It was directed by Robert Redford, and you can tell the acting is so good. There's clearly an actor behind the camera telling exactly how these characters are supposed to feel to the actors. Very clear, very actor-driven, character-driven, but it is a melodrama, so there's a lot of high intensity, scenes of people yelling at each other and crying. Donald Sutherland can cry like no one else. It is heartbreaking. And Ordinary People gets to the aesthetic of the 1980s right off the bat. Gone are the handheld camera, natural lighting. No, everything is locked down on a tripod. The symmetry of the shot is perfect and the lighting is expressive in color and roughness. So in the house, it's very cold and blue, but in the psychiatrist's office, it starts to get warmer and warmer until the psychiatrist is practically orange in one scene. It's very expressive in the production. It's not in the city, it's in suburbia. It's not in New York, it's not in LA. It's in the suburbs of Chicago. We see Chicago a few times, but it's like in the summer, so it's like pretty. The real story is taking place in the home and it's very well done, a lot of emotions. It, it started off the 80s with a bang. Like, this movie is good. I was so surprised. This movie deserves all the praise it gets. It is so good. There are so many just very emotional uh, reveals and monologues. Do Donald Sutherland, the way he talks to his wife in this movie, he's begging for hope and she just shuts him down, and she is the coldest, evilest woman in, in the world. And the wife is played by Mary Tyler Moore, and she is playing against type so well. I didn't even know it was her. The, I mean, it's more than just the acting. It's more than just the lighting. It's very well written. It takes itself very seriously and, and earnest and authentic in terms of what happened and how the kid is living through it. It reminded me a lot of Donnie Darko and Dead Poet Society and Goodwill Hunting. Like, it, somehow those movies come together in this. It's incredible. Definitely a must see. Like, I'm, I'm serious. The 80s started out good and then kind of faded off near the end for the Oscar pictures. Speaking of that dip in quality, Chariots of Fire from 1981. You know it from the score, you know it from the guys running on the beach. They reference it in the Olympics when it was in London. It's British propaganda. <laughs> Beautifully shot, heavily inspired by Lenny Reifenstahl's Olympia from 1938, as in the German propaganda Olympic movie from 1938. So British propaganda movie from 1981. It's, it's the Germans Olympia. Like, look how beautiful we are. Look how gorgeous our bodies look, how, how Gorgeous are colleges and, and estates look. Oh, the green manicured pastures and our sweaters and 
all that. It's just, it's making them look so beautiful. And it's, it's like this weird argument against professional athletes. Like the Americans are the professionals, but we're the amateurs. We love it. So we deserve to win. What? These kids are professionals. Like I know they're like college kids or something. Uh, the way they phrased it was just weird. It's, it's a thin story with promising characters that have no climactic resolution. Like the movie just ends. There's no big final third act showdown or anything. Just, the British people just win their races and that's it. It's, it's weird. Honestly, the only thing I'm gonna remember from this movie besides them running on the beach is uh, the rich kid hurdling with the champagne glasses on the hurdles and it's like the slow-mo shot of it, of it kind of like swaying back and forth. It's, it is so beautifully filmed. The story is just nothing. And then next up is our first like biopic, like bio, biographical epic. And it's, it's a three hour Gandhi movie. <laughs> it took Richard Attenborough 20 years to film this thing. It, it is impressive how much he puts into these three hours. It's clear that he had a passion to tell this story it's just kind of a slog to get through if it weren't for Ben Kingsley. He won for Best Actor and it is incredible. I didn't understand what like cradle to grave biopic meant until I watched Gandhi and it's like, oh, okay, I get it now. It's all about the scale. It's all about how much makeup can we put on this actor to make him look like 20 years younger than he is and then like 50 years older than he is. It's all about how he can change his performance throughout the movie to show the age and the wisdom this character has earned throughout this whole thing. It didn't feel like I was watching 80s movies for most of this, besides like the slow-mo shot stuff. A lot of these movies just don't take place in the 80s. Gandhi especially, this movie feels very much like the 70s. There is some hardcore like lighting near the end of it, very expressive when Hindus are killing Muslims in the streets. It's like the way that's filmed, very 70s. And I, it, it took him this long to make this movie, so he probably had the 70s in mind and not like the new trends the 80s were getting. So it's, it's interesting to look at it that way, but it's the black sheep out of these winners. Not in quality, but just in tone and aesthetic. It's amazingly well shot on location. That is pretty consistent with some other winners. The technical achievements of this movie are crazy, but it's, it feels like homework when you're watching it. Like you learn a lot about Gandhi and about like British imperialism and the history of India and Pakistan and, and all that. It's like you learn a lot, which is I think Richard Attenborough's goal. He, was, he wanted to tell this story of history spanning like 50 years in three hours. So it's impressive but I don't see myself looking forward to watching it again. So I, I said Ordinary People started the 80s off strong and then it kind of tapered off near the end. No, not, not near the end, it, it, it was immediately after. So you have Ordinary People, Chariots of Fire, Gandhi, Terms of Endearment. Terms of Endearment pissed me off. I, I will say it's about the same level of frustration as Annie Hall but not because of the people behind the camera, just because of like, what, what these, these characters are terrible people. And I'm fine with having characters that are terrible people if there's like a reason behind it. Mary Tyler Moore's character in Ordinary People is a hateful woman. Like you hate her, but there's a reason why and it's believable. These characters in Terms of Endearment, I ju they just do the worst things imaginable for no reason. Everybody's cheating on each other, and I don't know why. Like, there's some good characters that the movie's like, this is a good guy. He's cheating on his wife. It's another melodrama. It's, this one is called an 80s weepy. It's very much like people doing bad things because the story needs something interesting to happen. Like, we can't just dwell on this terrible act. We have to go to the next one to keep people gasping, pearl clutching. Like, why would he do that? Why would she do that? Something, I, I, that's the only way I can guess why this movie is doing what it's doing. 
and it's kind of the, the trapped in suburbia and life sucks because your life isn't anything. You thought it was gonna be something and now it's this. So you're trying to find a fill for that desire to be wanted, to be special, that kind of thing. And then 94 minutes into this movie where it's like, all right, where are we going? Uh, the daughter gets cancer. Like we are a feature length film into this movie and suddenly it's a cancer movie? Are you kidding me? That's when I gave up on this movie. I don't know what it was trying to do besides make you feel things, kind of holding you by the shirt like, yeah, and she has cancer now. You feel bad now, don't you? No, I don't. I don't because you just threw it at me, like in my face. The two best scenes in this movie are Jack Nicholson driving the mom in his like sports car on the beach and it like gets stuck in the waves. That scene was actually pretty fun. Like he's, he's, he's a creep in this movie. He's such a creep. But his performance kind of makes it, not endearing, but it keeps it engaging. And then Jeff Daniels is the awful husband in this. What happens when the daughter goes through the cancer and what he does in the hospital room? Like that I'm gonna save. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil that part. But what the film chooses him to do during that, I've never been so infuriated towards a character than that moment. Like, it's an unforgivable act almost. And it's, it's very surprising after this whole movie that it's like, whatever to this guy. And then he does that and it's like, oh, my entire thought about him changed. I hate you way more than I did the past like 100 minutes. And that is impressive. So the next movie from 1984 is Amadeus. And I have to give a little asterisk to this. It's on Netflix, but it's the director's cut. So I watched the three hour director's cut. The theatrical cut is like two hours and 40 minutes. So you're like, oh, it's 20 minutes. That's kind of a lot. The things that the director adds for the director's cut is significantly, it makes it a completely different movie. So I can't really talk about this movie because it's like I didn't even watch it. I didn't watch the movie that earned the Best Picture Award. I watched the movie the director wanted to make and then the studio or the producers are like, let's shave this down a bit to make it more streamlined and that one won the award. This, this, this director's cut is, is a lot. <laughs> Besides that asterisk, uh, Beautifully shot, like candlelit scenes, elaborate costumes, set design. It's a period piece, an Oscar winning, grand scale period piece. Of course it's gonna look beautiful. Of course the costumes are gonna be fantastic. And both actors, amazing. They really drive this film forward with the most energy I've ever felt in a period piece of this scale. They are electric. And it's kind of like a jukebox musical, but it's, Mozart and Salieri's compositions as the score. That's kind of fun. Oh, you know these songs, so we're just gonna play them in the scenes, like both in the story world and at outside for us to feel the emotions and it's their music. Like that's really fun. Okay, now it's melted enough that I can start drinking it. <laughs> out of Africa, came out in 1985. Robert Redford is an actor. He's not directing it this time. It's another period piece melodrama, this time in Africa, during and after World War I. The fun thing about this movie is it shows the evolution of England's colonization of Africa. And it has like extinction as its subtext, which is one of my favorite little themes. It's the reason I finished Bad Batch. It's the only reason I finished Bad Batch. It was because season two is all about extinction. Season three wasn't. Anyway, <laughs> out of Africa's runtime, you feel it the most out of all of these like huge biopics in the 80s. This one, it's not boring, but like the romance between Meryl Streep and Robert Redford takes a long time to start. Like it's deep into the movie because we have to set up why she's there in Africa and how her first marriage is kind of a joke. Like it's not real. And then Robert Redford's there and they finally start being very romantic. And once that starts, it's a very beautiful movie. The acting is great. 
Robert Redford is just such an amazing actor, and he knows how to be sexy in a very stoic, macho, wild man way in this. Because he represents, ironically, the old Africa, where an Englishman can ride out into the wilderness, hunt game, be a part of the community with the indigenous locals, and not follow any rules. He can do whatever he wants. And the new Africa is pretty much a little England. They drive cars, they race badminton, I don't know, they have telephone poles, that kind of thing. The movie is about colonization, but it's also a period piece romance. And he represents the old Africa and she kind of re represents civilization. So it's that kind of conflict between them. It's, it's interesting, especially when they're like in a Jeep and she's like tying her hair and right behind her is like a hippo. And it's like, oh, wait, they're just filming in front of hippos. Like that's, or like water buffalo or stuff like that. Like there's some bad rear projection stuff like when they're flying the plane, but when they're like around the animals, it is legit and it's very impressive to like think of the logistics of like, all right, so there's gonna be drafts over here. So we're gonna frame the actors here. There's we're gonna drive out here, so we're gonna be surrounded by a herd of water buffalo. It's very, very visually stunning. It just kinda takes a while for you to really get invested into, okay, this is the movie. And uh, Meryl Streep fights a lion. Like, she, she fights it with a whip. There's some really cool shit in this movie. You just have to kinda wait it out a bit. Next is Platoon from 1986, and it's Oliver Stone's directorial debut. He wrote some pretty big projects before this, but it this was like the movie he was looking for because he is a Vietnam War veteran and it took him 10 years to make this movie and it's his story from Vietnam. Like he experienced these things. Some events are like truncated and some characters are combined and both his superiors, he like had at different times in his actual tour, but in the movie they're like butting heads right next to each other, but it is all inspired by like real events and people he knew and experienced, which makes this movie honestly 10 times better knowing that. If you watch it compared to the other like Vietnam classics, it's not as crazy, it's not as bombastic, it's not as epic. It's very consumable, but the fact that it's based on Oliver Stone's like life, life events, it's like the gateway movie to understanding the Vietnam War movies. So if you haven't seen it, watch it, and then watch Full Metal Jacket, Apocalypse Now, all of those movies after Platoon, because then it like recontextualizes a lot of things. It's pretty on the nose in what it's trying to say. There's no subtlety to it. It kind of beats you over the head with some ideas in terms of class struggle, racism and all that. And he's like grabbing you by the shirt and being like, this is what it's like. It's a very powerful experience. And Charlie Sheen is the leading man in this Vietnam War movie 10 years after Martin Sheen was the lead in his Vietnam War movie, Apocalypse Now. So that connection is pretty cool. The cast in Platoon is insane. Just look up anybody that was acting in the 80s, they were in this movie. Like Johnny Depp, is in this movie. Like, you don't even know he's there, but he's in there. This movie's one of the greats because it was real. It's kind of weird because the movie itself is good. It's a very good movie. But then the more you read about it, the better it gets. And it's now one of my favorite Vietnam War movies. Next up from 1987 is The Last Emperor, another cradle to grave biopic period piece in China. And it's The Last Emperor in China, and it's his life starting in like the early 1900s where the emperor is dead and so he is crowned emperor at like four years old. It follows him in the Forbidden City which was filmed for the first time ever from this movie. So imagine like you're an audience member in America. Oh, this looks like an interesting period piece like historical drama, I'll go see it. And then you see the architecture of this city. It's like a temple for the emperor that he's trapped in but it's so beautiful. And it's just like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. And the world hadn't until this movie. So that's kind of fun. These kinds of movies before the internet. It's like, well, what did, what did these things look like? I guess was like one of the main experiences of these movies. Like Gandhi, I had not seen India like that ever. 
And I'm sure most people back then had not seen India at all until like a movie or like a TV show or the news. But like there was a purpose to filming on location back then and showing what things actually looked like. Nowadays, there's so much of that that it's like, oh, sure, I could look it up and see what it is. But back then, going to the movie theater, it's like, whoa, this is what India, like, this is what happened in India? This is what happened to the last emperor of China? Holy shit. So it's kind of cool to see that there is, like, kind of a purpose for these movies back then. And nowadays, it's less grand because it's just going to be on Apple TV Plus two months later kind of thing. Next up is Rain Man from 1988. This is the most 80s out of all the winners. Like it's ordinary people with the sweaters and suburbia and clean cinematography. And then it's Rain Man with like the Ferraris and the sports cars and the, and the casino. But also like they drive through the American landscape in like very rural areas. So it's more of like a, a fuller picture versus ordinary people is more specific to a certain ecosystem. This is probably the one that people have seen the most out of out of all like the, the best picture winners before the 90s, it's like The Godfathers and then Rain Man is basically what I'm assuming most people have seen. So not much to really talk about this movie. I've seen it before like three times, but very 80s. Tom Cruise plays the most hateable person on screen, but because it's Tom Cruise, he knows how to keep it right on the line, like on the line, and you still like him. It is, it is impressive. And Dustin Hoffman also gives an incredible performance. There's a lot of split diopters, which is really fun, because like they're not connecting, and so that that like level of focus here blur, like a sharp divide, and then like long depth of field, visual disconnect between the characters, but also to keep them both in focus because both of them are equally as important in this movie. A really cool creative choice, and I love split diopters. So when I, every time I saw one, I was like, hey, split diopter, cool. It's one of the best road trip movies of all time. I just say that so blatantly, but I think the reason why is because of the Vegas casino sequence. I think if it was just them driving through the American landscape, rural houses, it would have been okay. But like that, that electric, timeless classic that is Rain Man comes from the casino scenes, them counting cards and all that. It goes from a pretty decent, really well done road trip movie. I don't know, name, like name another road trip movie out of the top of your head, like Kodachrome with Ed Harris and Jason Sudeikis on like Netflix. It's good, but you go from like Kodachrome to like Hangover, Zach Galifianakis like count the cards with like the numbers popping up around him. Like it, it goes from like zero to 100 in terms of real engaging entertainment value. I can put this on and like a frat boy will be like, that was a good movie. If you could do that with a road trip movie, you know what you're doing. It, it's a very engaging movie. Keeps it consistent every scene. It's like, oh, it's that scene. Oh, it's that scene. Something new pops up. Even just the random diner scene with the toothpicks. Now everyone knows about like 82 toothpicks, 82 toothpicks, 82, 82, 82, 246. Very quotable, great personalities, great acting, very beautifully shot. If it's a road trip movie, you have to have like the best cinematographer you can get to show each rest stop or state or landscape as its own character. You, like it has to be that visual distinction to show the progression that they're leaving where they are and they're in the middle of nowhere. You have to like visually show that within like two shots. And this movie gets it to a T. That shot of like the bridge, they're driving over there. I think it's like a Cleveland bridge. And it's, he's like humming to like the vibrations and stuff, Raymond in the back. But the way the, the camera like follows the bridge and then it comes down and you realize that Raymond is the one that's looking at it. It's like, it's very well done, the camera work. And lastly, we have Driving Miss Daisy from 1989. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I will say the 80s was less fun to watch than the 70s Best Picture winners. The 70s had way bigger peaks and way deeper valleys. This, this decade is pretty rocky with some really good ones, really good ones. 
But ending with Driving Miss Daisy was just kind of like, like kind of just deflates the tires. The one scene where Miss Daisy snaps at Hoke and makes him stay in the car so she can watch Martin Luther King give a speech and there's like that empty seat next to her and then it cuts to him listening to the same speech on the radio in the car right outside the building. That, that's the best scene in the movie by like a hundred margins. And then it's like, oh sweet, the movie's trying to say something, let's, let's go in that direction. And then like the next scene, it, she, oh, she has dementia, she has to go to an elderly home. We were finally getting somewhere. And then the movie checks its watch and it's like, oh shit, we have to end the movie soon. We have to, let's start act three. It's, it's just, ah, you, you finally had me after like, okay scene to like good scene to okay, okay. It's well shot, the actors are really good. Some of the lines are fun. But that one scene where it's like, yes, let your main characters do terrible things. As long as there's like a reason behind it, real stakes about like racism and like understanding like, oh, I'm not racist, but then she like calls her servants them and they and like all that. It's like, yes, there's, she has flaws. And this scene is like the, the climax of it. They are friends, but she doesn't want to admit that. Like she doesn't want him to sit next to her. She wants him to be there and wants to invite him but she doesn't want it to be known that they're friends. And it's like, that's so, that's so awful. That I love. Like they're not cheating on each other just to keep the plot engaging. There's like actual things being said about why they can't make the right choices. Same with Mary Tyler Moore's character in Ordinary People. She cannot come to grips that she is the reason her son is troubled. It's her, like she is the problem. And so is, so is the dad, but he's like, oh, I'm the problem. I'm gonna go to therapy. She's like, no, 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 no. Cause that means we admit that we're wrong. She dies on that hill. That's what keeps that movie interesting. And this movie almost gets there. And it's just like, nah, we gotta end the movie. Like we're running out of time, sorry. It's, it's so exhausting. <laughs> it reminds me of like hidden figures where it's the black ladies that are the the mathematicians, the, the calculators at NASA. And there's that one scene where Kevin Costner just beats down the bathroom sign with like a crowbar or something. And he's like, at NASA, we're one color. That didn't happen. So it's just, when you're making a movie about systematic racism, you like having that one guy that's like a revisionist history, like, oh, but NASA wasn't racist. Yes, they were. That's what this movie's about. When you have that one like white savior character for like revisionist history, it breaks the whole movie. At NASA, we're one color. I just spent the last hour showing how hard it was for her to have this job. And then, oh, but by the end of the movie, NASA needs to look good. So we're gonna have her be in the launch pad for the final scene. It's like, but that didn't happen. This movie doesn't have that character. Miss Daisy is never never steps to whatever they, the heck they made Kevin Costner do. It's never a revisionist, oh, but actually I, I, I liked people. I like, I saw them as equal. Not, no, re she really didn't. Even though she was going to that MLK speech, even though she did say at the end that she's friends with Hoke, for most of the movie, she still sees herself as above him and that's, that's the best part of that movie where it's like, no, 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 we're not gonna flinch. We're gonna, we're gonna play it straight. We're gonna play it as legit as possible. But it doesn't explore it, it just kind of shows it. Like it's not the focus of the movie. The friendship is the focus, not where she changes or anything. I mean, it is, but it's, it doesn't go as deep as you want it to go. It doesn't explore the cave past where the sunlight ends, you know? It's not total darkness, but it's an okay movie. It's just like, man, is this a best picture winner? Mm. Now that it's melted, I can drink it, so. I enjoyed my, my pina colada batched drink. Apparently that was the thing in the 80s, like they started just making batches for drinks so you didn't have to make it all together. 
and the pina colada was one of the popular ones. So yeah, that was that was the 1980s. Uh, some some good woods in there, but honestly not as fun as the 70s. The peaks weren't as high and the valleys weren't as low and more. It, it was more of a consistent stream of the melodramas and the period pieces. Really long, long movies. So hopefully the 90s is is better. But uh, yeah, so my, my rank list is right here if you want to check that out. And if you want to keep watching with me, follow me on Letterboxd. I'll put that down in the description. Uh, or you could just watch the 90s Best Picture winners on your own. They're pretty easy to spot. So you've probably seen them already. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time in the 1990s.